How have you been doing as an artist for the last crazy one and a half years? Oh man, yeah, it was, it was crazy, and we were ready to to tour. I guess to America tours, to European tours, uh, festivals, South America tour, and everything fell through. And then I went into the studio, and I was uh, checking out all the archives. And then I did. Um, I don't know if you if you heard about it last year. I did a best of was fifty six songs. The, Uh, Magic Diamonds album and uh, yeah and then I was um, checking out all the other material the Triumph and Agony recordings and then this year when we knew we couldn't you know tour like like we have planned and I thought okay then I want to do work on, on the Triumph and Agony live album and DVD or Blu-ray and yeah and we were trying to play a couple of uh, gigs uh, like beach chair open airs and last weekend I had my first real open air there was the Belgium Alcatraz festival which was great and yesterday I found out the Wacken Bullhead City got cancelled what I was really looking forward to and now we do some more stuff and next week we have more shows beach chair open airs and then we go to Austria there's some tattoo fairs where we will play and then some more festivals in England in uh, Sheffield uh, rocking the bowl on 11th of September yeah and then now we see if the tour with Michael Schenker in October that's still on I'm looking forward to that and then a whole big tour in November all over Europe so but we'll see we'll see if this will happen and yeah we, we're We're hoping for the best, but I'm flexible. So, yeah. So after so many months of like you know, being unsure of things, so you get used to it, and then you know you do the best you can. And and if we have, uh, if we would have toured like like before, I would have never done Triumph and Agony live or the Classic Diamond. So so that was good too. Like working in the studio, I'm working on a new album as well. But this will probably come out next year. And yeah, so I. I always try to to keep busy. Then you know, then you don't have any time to get depressed. So, <laughs> yeah, it's good to hear that. Uh, well, everything is coming back slowly, and let's keep fingers crossed that we don't go back to lockdowns anymore. Yeah, man, that was heavy. It was heavy, and I was still traveling and stuff. And um, yeah, and in some countries, total lockdown, and some other countries. It seemed like nothing happened, so I was like, it was weird. And and when I was doing the Triumph and Agony live album in the studio, there was a total lockdown, and we were, you know, like working in the studio. Everything was so exciting, you know. And I'm working on the Blu-ray, you could see the fans. Everything was like, you know, almost back to normal. And then I walked outside, and I was driving, and then no one there. Total ghost time. And, ghost town and sometimes i got stopped by the police and i said hey you know it's a lockdown you know what are you doing here on the streets and i said well i was working and i said yeah sure four o'clock in the morning you're working i said yes i'm a musician we always work at night you know and then they said oh yeah and i said yes <laughs> yeah so all the all the police officer there yeah then you they knew metal as well so most of them and then they let me go but um yeah It was uh, it was an adventure the last one and a half years and yeah. Absolutely, but yeah, we are of course talking about the Triumph and Agony Live album. Uh, but if if you uh, if you will, let's first go to the you know it's a uh, original uh, is Warlock's last album from '87. So what are like the first thoughts that uh, come to mind when you think about making that classic album? It's Almost 35 years ago. Yes, yes. Oh man, I tell you, it was such an awesome time, like 87. And, you know, absolutely, I think the highlight of metal, wow. And um, yeah, and then I had a little promotion tour for the True Steel album in New York, just three days. And wow. And then after two days, I thought I definitely want to stay. And everything fell into place. I met great people. And uh, we had a new manager for America and he said, 
his name was Alex, Alex Grobe. And he said, oh, you know, I, you know, I introduced it to somebody. Maybe he can show you the metal scene, the clubs, the record stores, which were open 24 hours in New York. That was awesome. So I said, yeah, you know, let's do it. So I was um, hanging out with Joey Ballon and he was a musician. And, you know, and he showed me all kinds of things and we got along great. And then after, you know, going, you know, to see all the clubs and record stores, you know, he said, do you want to do something else? And I said, yeah, how about we do a little jam session? So we went <clears throat> to his apartment and we jammed a little bit. And I told him about my first promotion tour to Hungary, which was really scary. It was in 83. And we had all our Burning the Witches albums in the trunk. And then they took them away from us on the border. You know, they were serious. And we thought, oh, my God, you know. And we thought we would go to jail because it was a totally different vibe, you know. And so I told Joey about it. And he said, wow, that's, that's interesting. So we wrote our first song, East Meets West. And then we thought, man, that, that, that's pretty cool. And I played it for Alex. And he said, hey, you guys seem to have really good chemistry. Why don't you go on, you know, write more songs? And we did. Second song was Three Minute Warning. Then the third one was Make Time for Love. And actually, that was inspired by a VG board. Joey showed me all kinds of stuff. And the VG board was totally forbidden in Germany in the 80s, I think. That's what I heard. And he said, you want to play it? And I said, sure, you know, being a teenager, you always want to do what's forbidden. So, so we played the BG board and I asked Joey if he can ask this spirit uh, if uh, he, she, it has a message for me. And the message was, Doro, make time for love. And I couldn't believe it. And then we wrote our first ballad for Triumph and Agony, Make Time for Love. And then we wrote song after song. And uh, when we wrote All We Are, I was singing it. I thought, yeah, I definitely want to have like a big gang vocal. So we invited all our friends, you know, even people on the street. I asked, you know, can you come up and sing the background? And, and all the, you know, the American people, they were so cool. I said, oh, that's cool. You know, I'm singing on a record. So everybody came up and we were doing the background for All We Are. And we could really tell this had a lot of magic. And it, it was like, you know, and then mixing it, man, we, we knew that was probably the first single. Yeah. And uh, then we had the whole album ready, ready to go. And we were kind of sad that everything was going to an end. And, um, and then we said, let's do one more song. You know, it doesn't even have to be on the record, just one more song for fun. And we wrote, um, at first, Joey said, what kind of song you would like to write? And I said, well, the fastest, most brutal, most aggressive song. And then out came this ballad for Emma. The first one in German, little English, little Spanish sentence. Yeah, and then the record was done and um, we delivered it to the record company and everybody was excited. And yeah, and then we hopped on tour with Ronnie Jenks Dio in Europe and Megadeth in the States and you know, and every day it was like, you know, it was getting more and more, you know, like like MTV played all we are on heavy rotation. I could host Headbangers Ball a couple of times and, you know, and it became huge. And it was like an 87, 88 for me that time was like, I had the best memories and, you know, great people involved, great time for metal. Um yeah, it was it was awesome. So and Cozy Powell played some drums on the record as well, the legendary Cozy Powell. So that gave extra power and ah, so it was really it was wonderful. And yeah, uh, and I think the whole Triumph and Agony album that was like for us that was like you know a chance of a lifetime. And you know, and we we had like yeah, we had like yeah, that was the biggest record and yeah and then we thought okay now you know we just start out we can do it even bigger and bigger and then we got in trouble with the name because my uh, manager in Germany he was the merchandiser so he was interested in you know selling merch and he took away the name Warlock from us he had nothing to do with the Warlock to start with but you know we went to court many you know, many lawsuits and stuff. And then um, then the record company said, okay, you are almost done with the second album. That was Force Majeure. And, you know, I said, well, call it Doro. And then when everything is resolved, then you call it Warlock again. We thought, okay, let's do it. But that took 20 years. 
I had to wait 20 years to get the rights to the name Warlock back. So, so then, yeah, we continued with the oral, but it was never my plan to, you know, to, to have not the Warlock thing. It was always like, you know, it was, I was so attached to it, of course, and I never planned to do a solo career, but I always wanted to do music. That's what I knew always right from the start, you know, whatever it takes. And then it always went up and down and up and down and, you know, but the best memories I have, you know, of the triumph and agony, the making of it and the time and, oh man, it was like unbelievable. And, and touring with Ronnie James Dio, he was my favorite singer, my, you know, main inspiration. So that was so, everything was so awesome. And yeah, and, but I think all the other records, they were leading towards triumph and agony, burning the witches was the start and hellbound, true steel. And then, you know, so I think we did all the, prep work before and but Triumph and was really uh, starting to become big and uh, to you like uh, what were the biggest differences on playing the album live in the 80s and then 30 years later what have been the biggest uh, like changes in the live concerts oh, actually not much <laughs> there was not much difference um, yeah just the songs we have never played before. There was actually, yeah, there was an adventure and we weren't sure if it would work, but they were great and Make Time for Love was so soulful and Kiss of Death was like, you know, very like atmospheric. It's like a vampire song and a Three Minute Warning was great to play again in our set list. So yeah, lots of energy. It reminded me on the early days, like when we were doing really like, yeah, kind of speed metal and, you know, and, and Johnny, you know, he plays it so fast, you know, everybody tries to <laughs> get in all the riffs and, you know, and all the notes and I get, I squeeze in all the lyrics. So, so it's a lot of fun. It's definitely a lot of fun. And, um, but actually, yeah, it, it has the same vibe like the eighties when people hear it, they are totally on fire. They sing along like, you know, oh, we are it's always like, you know, that's, still our our favorite anthem and in for Emma, there's a middle part which that wasn't in in the 80s because i toured uh, one time in um in in the states and i think it was saint paul and uh we played for Emma, and then suddenly the audience was singing something and that's actually what you hear on on the record i thought it's such a nice part and after the concert, you know, I tried to find some of the fans who were singing. I said, hey, did you guys make it up? And I said, yes, we made it up, especially for you, because that's metal. And I thought, oh, man, that is so metal when you go into a concert prepared, like, you know, that the fans are thinking of something. Wow, that was great. So I always sing for Emma with the middle part with the oh, 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 oh I love it. And, and it's very uh, emotional sometimes. People, they have tears in their eyes and this is really nice. So, so between heavy and fast and really, really, you know, like soulful. And I think, yeah, that record had like a lot of variety, really special songs. Um, Metal Tango was another one that was totally, you know, like, yeah, like there was a new combination, like tango and metal guitars over it. And so, yeah, I think there was, yeah. Well, a lot of good ideas and they still feel totally, they, they feel like we wrote them yesterday. I think they didn't age at all. It's still totally fresh and and all these songs, they mix perfect in our new set list. Like, you know, there's no difference between whatever, like East meets West and Raise Your Fist or All for Metal or, you know, it's like all, oh, it's like, yeah, it's, it feels great. <laughs> Yeah, I like I like that idea that the metal metal stays metal and it's still yes, the same. Yes, yeah, like absolutely. 